give it a few more minutes just uh, to let people come in. Uh, it's, uh, oh, people are really coming in now. That's, that's marvelous. I think um, I think we should get going because we've, we've only got 90 minutes. Can I wish you all a <clears throat> hearty welcome to to this uh, the session on, um, on biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. Thank you all so much for registering and uh, for your interest. This is a session of the GAUC. Uh, the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate Youth Summit in the lead up to COP26, which will take place in uh, Glasgow, UK, in a few weeks' time. I'm Guy Mitchley, and I represent uh, Stellenbosch University and the School for Climate Studies uh, at Stellenbosch University. And um, I'm a professor there, and I teach uh, global change uh, studies. I would just very quickly like to give a word of thanks to the GAUC organizers who have helped put, put this all together and have kept track of all the registrations. Thanks very much to, to all of you. Uh, I can see people really <laughs> coming in at quite a pace now, so that's, that's really great. Um, while, while they do, let me just quickly give a, a brief outline of what, uh, what, what's going to happen. We have eight speakers that are crammed into this 90 minutes and um, all great. And they're all addressing this extremely complex and challenging topic of the in intersection of climate change, biodiversity and ecosystem functioning and with particular relevance to pathways to net zero. Um, we're gonna start with two short messages from, from real global leaders um, in the international uh, space. So Bob Watson, ex-IPCC chair, and a real mover on the, in the area of big assessments and getting the message synthesized and across to policymakers. Uh, I don't think we can really thank him enough for the work that he's done on this, in this area. He's also done a lot of work with IPES, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And then uh, uh, Dr. Anne Larry Gaudry, who is the Executive Secretary of the IPES, the Governmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And uh, she'll, she'll also give us a short message. So I'm, uh, I'm a little bit of a Zoom neophyte, but I, I think I know I think I'm able to do this. I'm first going to share my screen and uh, get, uh, get Bob and Anne to address us. And then I'm going to go to. Um, Dr. Chris Trisos, who's um, one of the coordinating lead authors of the Africa chapter, regional chapter in, in the new IPCC report, and uh, Professor Wendy Foden, who is at the South African National Parks and is a 
a mover and shaker in the IUCN Climate Change Specialist Group. And then after that, we'll have a few questions. It's a short little question and answer, and then four students in the climate school and um, related to the, the School of Climate Studies at Stellenbosch talking about their, their, um, their work. Great. I, I, I hope I'm perfectly audible to everybody. Um, if anybody can give me a thumbs up just to make sure that, that, that that's good. Oh, that's we good. can hear you clearly, Guy. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, having, having burned a, a couple of minutes, I'm going to head across to, to, to my screen and uh, going to let Bob Watson speak to us for a few minutes. Right, does everybody see Bob there? Great. Right. I need to mute myself. Hello, my name is Bob Watson. I'm the former chair of IPC. I'm sorry to do this to you. Is the sound also on? <clears throat> I made a mistake recently. Yeah, it's a fine guy. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. See, it best. And recently co led the document Making Peace with Nature. Climate change, loss of biodiversity, and pollution are three interconnected issues that threaten achieving any of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and hence threaten human well-being for current and future generations. Each of these environmental issues is also an economic, development, security, social, moral and ethical issue and adversely affects all people, rich and poor, but mostly the poorest people in the poorest countries. The Earth's climate is warming at an unprecedented rate due to increasing atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases, in particular carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide caused by the combustion of fossil fuels and land use practices. The Earth has already warmed by about 1.2 degrees Celsius since the Industrial Revolution and is accompanied by changes in precipitation, an increase in the frequency and severity of extreme weather events, an increase in sea levels <coughs> and of mountain glaciers, permafrost and sea ice. Biodiversity and the degradation of ecosystems and their services are also occurring at an unprecedented rate due to a combination of direct threats, land and sea use change, exploitation, climate change, pollution and invasive alien species. One million out of a total eight million plants and animals are threatened with extinction. Populations are in decline and species habitats are being lost. Ecosystems are being threatened. For example, at a 1.5 degree Celsius warming, 70 to 90 percent of warm water coral reefs would be in decline. And at two degrees Celsius warming, over 99 percent would be in decline. These changes in climate and biodiversity are already adversely affecting food and water security, human health, livelihoods, and displacing millions of people at a significant economic cost. The world is not on course to achieve any of the environmental goals. While some progress was made to conserve and restore biodiversity, none of the 20 Aichi biodiversity targets were fully met. And with the current pledges to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the world is not on a pathway to meet the Paris target of limiting warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius and preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100, but we are on a pathway to 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. While climate change has not been the dominant driver of biodiversity loss to date, if the Paris targets are not met, climate change will likely become the dominant driver in the coming decades. Hence, it is critical that the issues of climate change and loss of biodiversity are tackled together. The upcoming COP26 for climate change and COP15 for biodiversity must acknowledge these interconnections and develop harmonized actions and goals. 
We need to transition to a low carbon economy and conserve and restore biodiversity. This will require transforming our relationship with nature and transforming our economic, financial and productive systems and reassessing our norms and value systems. We need to complement the use of gross domestic product as a measure of economic activity by using inclusive wealth in decision making, built human and natural capital, which is a much better measure of sustainable economic growth. We need to eliminate direct perverse fossil fuel, transportation, mining, agriculture, forestry and fishery subsidies and use the money saved for funding sustainable energy and agricultural practices and technology. We need to address indirect subsidies by internalizing externalities, putting a price on pollution, and we need to embrace the concept of a circular economy. We need to manage our productive systems holistically, energy, agriculture and water, as each influence and depend on each other. We need to promote a healthy diet, reduce food and water waste, and adopt a one health approach that simultaneously secures optimum outcomes for human health, animal health, and the health of the environment. While the industrialized countries who are responsible for most of the environmental damage to date must take the lead, without concerted actions by all countries, we cannot successfully address any of these issues. While the principle of differentiated responsibility is well accepted, it is also well recognized that most developing countries will require financial and technology assistance from developed countries and through the private sector. These issues are not just for governments. We need all branches of national and subnational governments to work with international organizations, financial organizations, private sector, NGOs, civil society, indigenous people, scientific and educational organizations, and the media. We need polycentric governance structures where all voices are heard, but the power of the vested interest who want to maintain the status quo is eliminated. The time for action is now. The decade of the 2020s is critical. We need to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases globally by at least 45% relative to 1990 by 2030 as a full step to net zero emissions by mid-century. And we need to conserve and restore biodiversity if we are to attain any of the SDGs. If we fail to act, our children and grandchildren will never forgive us given cost-effective and socially acceptable solutions exist. Thank you. Great. Um, if, uh, could I ask you uh, to mute your mics uh, if you haven't done so already? Um, and can I just say that um, in that talk, in uh, six minutes, um, you've heard a master summarize the critical issues that face us. Um, <clears throat> right, I want to, whoops, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Apologies for my, my rather poor Zoom control <laughs> ability. I'm going to uh, shift now to uh, Dr. Anne Laurie Gaudry. And she's got a very short uh, message as well. Sounds like she, her, her volume is a little bit higher than Bob's was. So I'll tune that down just a little bit. And, uh, and then after that, we'll hit our main speaker. Oh, I've got a share. Where's the night even thought? All right. I think we're ready to go. Participants and to students uh, in particular, I have a very simple uh, message uh, for you today. Uh, I believe that your alliance uh, should be uh, renamed 
uh, the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate and Biodiversity, uh -huh. even though I realize that that does not make for an easier acronym to pronounce. But here is uh, why. The world is experiencing not only a climate crisis, but also a biodiversity crisis. These two crises are interconnected, they are mutually reinforcing, and they can only be solved if addressed together. I'd like to make four points uh, derived mainly from the IBES Global Assessment of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which came out in 2019, and from uh, the IBES IPCC co-sponsored workshop report, which just came out a couple of months ago. First, nature, biodiversity are deteriorating at a rate and scale unprecedented in human history, as you may have heard. One million of plant and animal species out of a total of about 8 million are threatened with extinction. And this is causing uh, many of the contributions that people derive from nature uh, to go down uh, as well. For example, the capacity of ecosystems to pollinate our crops or to provide uh, clean water or uh, air quality or also to control uh, erosion. And not a single one of the 20 uh, biodiversity targets uh, which had been set for 2020 have been reached at the global level in the context of the work of the Convention on Biological Diversity. So second, what causes this? Well, climate change is, uh, as you will know, one of the uh, main direct drivers uh, of biodiversity loss. It currently is ranked as the third such uh, driver. The first two are land use and sea use changes, land use change such as deforestation. The second one being the over exploitation uh, of resources uh, such as overfishing, for example. Third point, uh, biodiversity loss is not only the victim of climate change, if you will, but it is a major component of the solution to climate change. So protecting, restoring, sustainably using biodiversity can make important contributions to climate mitigation and adaptation. Those are the so-called nature-based solutions. Currently, uh, our ecosystems are absorbing about one third of uh, annual greenhouse gas uh, emissions. But they could do much more, and we know how to do that. There are many options to do so. Reducing deforestation, restoring carbon and species-rich ecosystems, improving forest management, or adopting sustainable agricultural practices. All of these can either avoid uh, greenhouse gas emissions, or they can uh, absorb uh, more carbon from the uh, atmosphere and thus uh, mitigate against climate change. So fourth and finally, however, and very importantly, some climate uh, mitigation and adaptation measures can have negative impacts on biodiversity and on nature's contributions to people, and they should really be avoided. And we are, for example, talking about the massive deployment of bioenergy crops, which compete for land with natural ecosystems and threaten biodiversity, and in fact, also food security. So in conclusion, uh, biodiversity loss and climate change can only be solved if addressed together. That really is a major consideration in the context of COP26, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, but also and importantly in the context of the work of COP15 of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is due to approve a very important document, a new global biodiversity framework for 2030. I wish you a good meeting and I thank you very much for your attention. Great. Um, well, <laughs> that's uh, also uh, fabulous, uh, much uh, you know, nuanced message there uh, about the tremendous challenges that we face. Yeah. 
finally bringing these two conventions together uh, and uh, looking at them in uh, juxtaposition with one another. I, I, I want to go now to our two um, keynote speakers, uh, Dr. Chris Trisos and Professor Wendy Foden. I, I think here we're going to shift our focus to uh, an African and Southern African perspective on, on these issues. And um, uh, Chris, as, us, as you, you will know from the um, description of our session, uh, has recently completed his uh, role as a coordinating lead author of the Africa Regional Chapter in the IPCC report due out early next year. And he is going to uh, share his uh, idea, his views with us uh, on, this, um, on this challenge. So Chris, I'm going to make you host and give you screen sharing rights. And make co-host. Thanks, Guy. Oh, you're on mute. I'll mute myself now. Hand over to you. Okay. Um, I'm going to. If I share my screen now. Are you able to see that? Yeah. Thank you. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. I have my camera off due to some limited bandwidth where I am. Um, if at any stage the um, connection gets bad, please let me know. Um, so this is just a, a brief outline of my talk. I'll be talking about climate change risks. Uh, excuse me. Sorry. One second. This is jumping around. I don't know. It should be doing an automatic slide at once. Okay, uh, climate change risks to biodiversity in Africa. I'll be talking about transdisciplinary research on climate change risks, climate change risks to biodiversity in Africa, and then cases of multiple interacting risks to biodiversity, not just from climate change. And so first I'd like to um, promote this transdisciplinary approach to climate risk research, where it's doing science in teams. These are interdisciplinary teams, social scientists, environmental scientists, but also that the science is actionable. It includes concerns from policymakers, the questions they would like to see answered to make this climate risk research actionable. It's going beyond the basic science to insightful science that's hopefully useful for decision-making and including policymakers in the teams right from the beginning of the starting of the science. So with that out of the way, a focus on climate change risk more specifically, this is a definition from the recent IPCC Working Group 1 assessment that was published in August this year, defining climate change risk as the potential for adverse consequences for human or ecological systems. In the context of climate change, risks can arise from potential impacts of climate change, as well as human responses to climate change. This is a diagram of the climate change risk factors showing hazards, which in this example could be a marine heat wave, exposure, that might be the area of coral reefs exposed to the marine heat wave, vulnerability, potentially the adaptive Recording capacity in progress. of those reefs, as well as the response options that we have available to us and the ways the coral reefs respond. So the climate change risk is really generated by the four of these things coming together, the climate hazard, what systems are exposed, how vulnerable those are, and the response. So what we know about climate change risks to biodiversity so far, already there's evidence of widespread impacts of increased atmospheric CO2 in climate change 
on biodiversity across Africa. Existing patterns of economic development and land use change are compounding climate change risk for ecosystems and biodiversity, and risks to biodiversity and ecosystem functioning are expected to increase with every fraction of increase in global warming. So here's one example, the projected timing of ecological disruption from climate change. This is from the Congo Basin. What you're looking at here in the gray is the historical temperature for this region. In the red is the projected temperature increase under a high greenhouse gas emission scenario. Focusing on this dark black line though, this is the percentage of species at that site projected to be exposed to potentially dangerous temperature conditions over the course of the 21st century. And the important thing to look at here is that it's not a very smooth and gradual line, but you can get these abrupt jumps. So if we look at climate change disruption over time, it might not always be gradual. It could be that we get these abrupt exposure events where in the 2040s, for example, this projection shows that we might go from about a quarter of the species exposed to just over half of the species exposed to temperature conditions beyond which we've observed them in the wild. So there's a potential risk of local extinction here. And this is quite a nice approach because we can play biodiversity risk a bit more like a movie instead of looking at some far off time periods. And so what you're watching here now, as the colors turn from purple to oranges to yellows, is an increasing percentage of species at a location exposed to potentially dangerous temperature conditions. You can see we project that this will start in tropical oceans in the first half of the century, but spreading onto the land in Central African forests in West Africa towards the second half of the century, and then really spreading across the tropics by the end of the century under this high emission scenario. So that is for a scenario where global warming reaches around four degrees Celsius or more, but we can avoid a lot of this risk by reducing fossil fuel emissions and keeping global warming well below two degrees Celsius. So this movie now is for a low emission scenario. You'll see in this decade, a lot of the risk looks similar. There's some amount of warming locked into the climate system. The tropical oceans are still hot spots for risk. Parts of the West African marine ecosystems there off the coast of West Africa still high risk, but really the risk a lot less already by the second half of the century compared to the high emission scenario. So much, much lower risk now. If you look across the tropics now, there's much less yellow and orange in this figure than for the high emission scenario. So a lot to be, a lot of damage or a lot of risk avoided for African biodiversity by keeping to a low emission scenario. This is that same message, but for a different study that looked at insects, vertebrates, and plants globally, published by Rachel Warren and others in 2018. The left panel here is the avoided loss of species from holding global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius instead of two, 1.5 degrees Celsius being the most ambitious temperature target for stabilizing the climate under the Paris Agreement. And then on the right-hand panel, you'll see the benefits of holding the climate to 2 instead of 3.2 degrees Celsius global warming, where 3.2 is around the upper range of what current government pledges would get us to. And in both cases here, I'd like you to look at sort of parts of southern and central Africa, where up to 0.4 or almost half of the species in a region might avoid local extinction by holding global warming to lower levels. So Southern Africa and parts of East Africa are really major, major areas where we can avoid species extinction risk by keeping global warming to low levels. Um, even globally, there are, are hotspots for avoided damages from stronger climate mitigation action. And these risks extend also to freshwater fish species in large African watersheds. This is looking at the Senegal watershed, Zambezi, and other large watersheds across Africa. And what you're seeing here in the dark colors is risks at 4.5, so really uncontrolled global warming, versus in the yellow at 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is the most ambitious goals under the Paris Agreement. And if you look at the Senegal watershed, for example, under high global warming, you have over three quarters of fish species exposed to unprecedented warm temperatures 
and changes in river flow and under the most optimistic global warming levels under the Paris Agreement, we're at about a third, which is still a really substantial risk. In other river basins, it's down to perhaps around 10% if we hold global warming to 1.5 Celsius. So really substantial risks to South Af sorry, Africa's freshwater fish species from climate change, but much, much less with 1.5 compared to higher levels of global warming. Vegetation change, here the picture is more complicated. There's strong evidence that increasing CO2 has already led to increasing encroachment of forest into savanna and savanna into grassland. But in the future, the effect of increasing CO2 could be moderated by changes in aridity. For example, in areas where there might be increasing aridity with climate change, we might actually see expansion of desertification of grassland areas into forests. But in areas with increased precipitation or decreasing aridity on the bottom right here, that might further increase that expansion of forests into grasslands and into shrubland areas. So really unclear in, some, in many regions which direction the vegetation change will go, particularly in parts of East Africa where rainfall forecasts the East African rainfall par paradox, high uncertainty in climate models, how that will turn out. Turning now to the risk to wild harvested food plants, a Southern African example here um, in the purples is showing places where climate suitability might increase for a large number of species under a relatively high global warming level. So as species climate niches move higher along the escarpment of South Africa into the Drakensberg Mountains, for example, but areas further north in northern South Africa and in Botswana, seeing potentially hundreds of species decrease in climate suitability for wild harvested food plants people use for teas, for medicines, for traditional foods. So a lot of what I talked about there was climate risks from that hazards part of the diagram I showed you earlier in my talk, now turning to risks from responses. We can have climate change risks to biodiversity being indirect, coming from risks to other sectors like agriculture. This can also be from mitigation responses to reduce greenhouse gases, such as afforestation. We can get transition risks, such as the financial impacts on countries from changing different energy systems that might cascade to impact investment in conservation, for example, and also trade-offs with other objectives, such as the sustainable development goals. So here's an example of shifting agricultural zones. The blue areas here are places where that are currently not suitable for major commodity crops, but they become suitable. And the red areas are areas that are uncultivated that could become suitable with climate change for multiple major crops. So you'll see really big changes in the northern hemisphere with global warming, more areas becoming suitable for, for major commodity crops. In Africa, this is less pronounced. Although this crop model in this study is not that sophisticated, it still shows the general principle that with agricultural zones shifting, for example, in parts of Central Africa, currently rainforest areas or high biodiversity areas that are not suitable for agriculture of a particular major crop may become suitable and add a second risk to biodiversity indirectly from climate change. Looking at the mitigation of greenhouse gas side, risks from afforestation, so clearly protecting and restoring indigenous forests is good for climate change, but many areas targeted for tree planting in Africa erroneously mark Africa's open ecosystems, such as grasslands or savannas, as degraded and suitable for afforestation. If you look at the map on the left here, the orange shows grassy biomes, ancient grassy biomes across Africa, the pink is showing restoration opportunities identified by a tree planting campaign. And the red is showing areas where these opportunities for tree planting have been identified in grassy biomes. So where there's a risk of conversion from grassland to forest with tree planting and a risk of losing ancient and rich biodiverse systems. These risks can also arise from other land-based mitigation such as bioenergy crops, for example. And then lastly, many risks can compound or cascade. So multiple risks can interact. On the top here, compounding is just two risks interacting. On the bottom, a cascade is when one risk can trigger multiple other risks. For example, a drought triggers tree death. And with heat, you then get a wildfire. 
that causes risks to property and biodiversity, but also leads to fish kills in rivers. Sorry. So to move to an example now, here's an example of compounding risk. This is a work by Tim Newbold and others. In the orange, you're seeing places where climate change risk to biodiversity is projected to be high. In blue, where it's risk from land use that's projected to be high. And in black, areas where both risks are high. So there's compounding of this risk of climate change and land use change. So you can see in parts of West Africa, in parts of South Africa, and North Africa especially, interacting risks from climate change and land use change, both causing risks to biodiversity, emphasizing what our speakers were saying earlier about these interlinked problems of climate change and biodiversity, and we have to address them together. Here's two case studies showing that. On the left, we have risks to cities facing water scarcity. This is an example from Cape Town. There was the risk of day zero drought, the drought made more severe as a result of climate change, or the likelihood of the severe drought made more likely because of climate change. And this risk of, of a drought in Cape Town, the day zero, is linked with multiple other risks, the risks to human life. There was a risk to the financial budget of the city as people went off grid and used their own groundwater. That led to risks to ecosystems, and there was a risk to the reputation of the government in Cape Town if they didn't find rapid solutions to bring more water into the municipal system that led to further risks to ecosystems. So really showing how this risk to ecosystems from climate change comes not just from the direct hazard to the ecosystems, the drought, but also how that drought affects people and the responses people have to those droughts. On the right here is fishing communities in the tropics. The risk to coral reefs from marine heat waves, for example, can lead to risks to property and infrastructure where degraded reefs are less able to protect seaside communities from storm surges or sea flooding. This can lead to risks to cascade, to risks to human life, and also affect the fishing industry. So again, showing how multiple risks interact, and a risk to biodiversity is just one of these. And as we see climate change accelerating, these types of risks are really realities that conservation biologists, municipal managers, local governments, they have to manage across these multiple risks. And I think it's important for us going forward to be conscious of communicating not just one risk, but thinking about climate and biodiversity and human systems as all interlinked. So thank you so much for your attention and happy to ask more questions later. Chris, that's uh, brilliant. You've given us a really fascinating look at um, the multifaceted challenges facing, facing Africa. Um, and um, <laughs> it's really amazing to see uh, how well that is, that is developed now. Um, I now will make you, will remove your co-host permissions. Um, I'm sure there'll be some comments and questions on that. Uh, <laughs> you've raised some really yep. interesting issues. Yeah, I'm going to, ha I'll hand over now uh, if I can find uh, Wendy. Uh, there's a phone on my, on my list of uh, people. Here we go. Um, Wendy, I'm going to make you co-host. Uh, Hi, Guy. Ah, yes. Hi, everybody. Hi. There we go. Yes, I want to make you co-host, not Erica Nokia. Right. <laughs> uh, um, I'm going to mute myself, and you. I think you now have the power. Great. Am I sharing screen? Are you able to see? Yes, sir. Uh, am I in pre presenter mode in your uh, version or not? Uh, you're in the notes mode, unfortunately. Oh, the notes. Right. <laughs> So swap your swap your panels around. Is there a quick way to do that? Uh, hang on a sec. Let me just uh, display settings. Right there we go. <laughs> Thanks um, very much, Guy, and um, lovely to hear the previous speakers. And I'm um, really privileged to have an um, opportunity to speak to you all about um, a subject very close to my heart. Uh, so, what do we do about climate change and biodiversity? How do we help adaptation um, from a conservation perspective? Um, and of course, there are so many ways that uh, climate change impacts biodiversity. 
Uh, we typically think of temperature, but of course, as Chris and others have mentioned, there's greenhouse gas changes like elevated CO2, rising sea levels, extreme events, ocean acidity. Um, there are the biotic pressures on any species, for example, by changes in habitat. And then, of course, there's humans responding to climate change, as Anne mentioned, that can itself be a threat to biodiversity. So quite a challenge um, for species to handle all of these things, plus, of course, their original threats. One I particularly want to highlight is the issue of extreme temperature events, heat waves. Um, so if you look at the blue line, which is the historic uh, temperature profile, um, you'll see that, for example, at 35 degrees, which is very hot temperatures, you used to spend, you know, the yellow triangle amount of time in that, that, um, in that state. But as temperatures warm, um, you land up with much more time in, in that um, high temperature zone and then some very extreme temperature um, there. And although it's just, for example, two degrees change, that extra time in very hot conditions is what's seeming to, in Southern Africa at least, uh, make a huge difference to how species are doing, uh, typically for the worst. Um, so just some little examples. Um, in our parks, um, such as Richtersfeld National Park, we now have temperatures in excess of 35 degrees centigrade for a third of the year. Really tough on those species. Simil similarly, in um, uh, Kalahari Hemsbok National Park, um, we've got, uh, again, temperatures in excess of 35 degrees for a third of the year. Really tough uh, for the biodiversity and, of course, for us trying to do tourism and for the tourists. Um, now, how are all those pressures from, from our changing climate and associated factors impacting on species? Well, there are really five key ways. And on the left, you can see how they can impact them negatively. And on the right, how it can be positive. Uh, so I'm just going to go through them um, briefly. So, of course, if abiotic conditions change um, and they no longer suit the species, that's a problem. If their habitats or microhabitats become unavailable um, or poor quality, uh, if interspecies interactions go wrong, so things that they wanted, for example, they needed prey or, or, or mutualisms, um, but also if competitors or diseases arise. Uh, timing can go wrong, and of course, climate change can exacerbate non-climate change related threats. So I'm going to give you an example of how those things can impact species and have been impacted. So these are spectacle flying foxes, um, Queensland, tropical um, uh, Australia. Um, and these guys hang out in trees, they are quite large as you can see. And when it gets hot, um, they uh, spread saliva onto their bodies um, to cool them, evaporative cooling. Um, but there was a, a heat wave um, in Queensland that lasted about five days and the temperatures were so hot that um, about a third of the population, about 11,000, Bats fell out of the trees and, um, and died, unfortunately. The temperatures simply exceeded the thresholds that they could cope with. Uh, another example is in Tankwakaru National Park here in South Africa. Um, the birds can't tolerate um, temperatures above the low 50 degrees centigrade, um, and they really need water to be able to thermoregulate. Now, the temperatures seldom reach those 50 degrees, but on the ground, the temperatures get super hot that they can't land and actually get to the water, even though it's there. So a real challenge for us there. Um, what about uh, species that lose habitats or microhabitats? Well, of course, they have the option, hopefully, if they can, to move. And they can move upslope or towards cooler conditions. So I want to give you an example of the Table Mountain ghost frog. And I'm sitting here in, in Cape Town, um, right next to that mountain as, as I speak. Um, and so this gorgeous little frog lives only on Table Mountain, um, the top and the sides, really. Um, it's one of four endemic species um, in Table Mountain National Park. There you can see us right at, right at the tip of Africa. Um, so there's not really anywhere to go south, but its range is so small anyway. And there it is, nearly at the top of the mountain, really nowhere to go up either. Um, so very, very concerning for, for that species. Um, on the left, we've got one of our Proteus, Proteus, Proteaceae species, the um, uh, silverleaf will pincushion, beautiful species, again, just in the Fainball, southern tip of Africa. So 
there's not really anywhere to go. But in any case, if seeds are dispersed by ants, so it's just not really going to go anywhere very fast. Terry Gray is going to be speaking about the quiver tree later, and that's in a similar predicament. Um, its range is shifting south and it can't keep up. Then we've got the Bramble K. Melamus um, in um, uh, the ocean north of Australia, between Australia and Papua New Guinea. Um, living on just a tiny little bramble, um, little island called Bramble Cay. Uh, sea level rise and a storm made water sweep right over the top and the species became extinct. The first mammal to go extinct due to climate change. Corals and climate change, of course, you've all heard about coral reef bleaching. Um, and what happens is the little algae that uh, live inside the coral um, and photosynthesize to give it food uh, get expelled. Um, and that's what causes the corals to bleach. Um, and again, close to home, the African penguins building, um, uh, uh, nesting at Boulders Beach, Cape Town, numbers are drastically declining, largely due to unavailability of food. Uh, the anchovies and sardines on which they rely um, have shifted their ranges far east um, of this coast. So it becomes very far for those species to, to move, to get to their prey. Um, and so numbers have declined drastically. Also because their guano um, has been harvested, they have to nest just in the open um, or under bushes, and that leaves their uh, eggs um, open to, to um, herbivory. But very importantly, from a climate change perspective, um, when they nest in the open, they get extremely hot, and you can see them panting here, trying to keep cool. Um, and so the adults can, of course, go down and hop in the ocean, but that leaves the chicks exposed and they um, quickly are, are um, preyed upon or, or die of heat. Um, so the numbers have been falling very dramatically and we're concerned, we're concerned about them as a species. Um, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but the impacts of climate change on biological processes and species are ubiquitous, um, and there's no question they're having a massive impact on our ecosystems. I think the real question is, what do we do about it? And that's where I'm excited to talk to you. So there's a study that Cobra et al. carried out a few years ago, um, where they looked at a lot of the studies that have... Um, uh, looked at, uh, basically have, have attempted into, uh, actions to combat climate change and impact on biodiversity. Um, and they saw that most of them fall into the category of those that we were kind of going to do anyway and help biodiversity to adapt. So they're sort of low risk things um, that we think will help biodiversity and hopefully it'll then just help itself. But of course, they're also the ones that try to address the direct conditions that are changing. So for example, the sea level rise itself, the, the temperature getting too hot, um, and, 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 and really try to deal with those particular impacts. Um, so to look briefly at those, the ones that we've been doing anyway are things like uh, if an, an uh, uh, ecosystem gets degraded, we basically restore and renovate. We manage our fire and grazing regimes. Um, we try to improve establishment conditions um, and um, uh, we, we work with uh, ecosystem function to make sure it continues. But if we were going to be serious about this in a climate change context, we need to take it a step further. So what if we can't do those ameliorations um, by natural means? What about engineering environments? When do we have to do that? Um, what about adjusting disturbance regimes using physical and chemical interventions that are not in line with what they previously were? Um, what about um, uh, when functions are lost? Do we have to use indigenous species? What if there are ones that are more suitable um, or, or more likely to survive that are non-local? Um, right, so now what about on those that enhance the adaptive capacity of biodiversity. So this is really conservation focused. Um, so before what we would do is promote genetic diversity to help the um, species adapt on their own. Um, look at uh, building redundancy into diversity um, and, um, and spatial planning. Um, we would make sure we had um, we we're optimizing habitat availability, representing different habitats refugia. 
um, and optimizing connectivity, heterogeneity. These are all standard conservation practice going back decades. And alleviating non-climatic other stresses, basically. But in a climate change world, uh, what if uh, the genetic adaptation can't happen quickly enough? Do we try some genetic intervention? Um, what about um, ensuring against loss of functions by, again, non-local species and functional diversity? Do we have to assist the movement of species when just optimizing connectivity isn't enough? Um, and what about if natural stresses are going to be too much for a species that is really battling also with climate change? These are things that we need to start thinking about. They're really challenging. They're really uncomfortable to think about. I'm not saying jump right in, but I'm saying the time is here to stop thinking it's, it's conservation business as usual. This is a new era. Um, some of the things, the concepts that they point to is this concept of ecological renovation, taking things to a new state, not trying to get us back to where we were. Um, and it really puts into question what's wild anymore and, and the value of wildness um, versus the value of species conservation or landscape conservation. Um, so I've got some examples of where we've done some of these. Guy, um, I've lost track of time. How many minutes do I have left? Uh, Wendy, if you can do, stick within two minutes, that would be great. <laughs> All right, obviously, because okay, I can. Yeah, we're, we're, we're doing okay. We're doing just great. fine. Yeah. Um, so um, in boulders, one of the things we're doing to help those nesting, um, those nestlings, the nesting birds, to, to increase their survivorship is build them super cool nests that are also protected against um, storms and, and, um, and predators. And so they've got these state-of-the-art cool ceramic nests and we've put fences in them um, and weather stations up to prime prepare for heat waves. Um, and there's our team putting them in and some of the challenges that we encountered and the birds are in and they've had a season nesting in them, very exciting. Um, and this comes part of an overall strategy where when things get too hot, um, we work with Sandcop to remove these chicks, raise them in captivity. Um, and, and really we're down to species levels where every individual counts. Um, then in terms of the, the Table Mountain ghost frog, um, one of the things that's been really key is some research um, that's uncovered that a, a really key factor for the survival of the species is the temperature of the water that it occurs in, and it occurs in these little streams. Luckily, there are some dams at the top of the mountains, so one of the strategies for keeping things cool could be um, to let water out of the dam at times when things are getting too hot. But some challenges involved in that are, of course, convincing uh, the engineers in the city to do that. Um, but this one, I just wanted to uh, um, highlight the role that researchers can play, that engineers can play and are needed, activists to convince those folk and the conservation managers to, to carry it out. Um, so, yeah, lots of, lots of different roles for people who want to step into this exciting space. Um, in terms of the Tankwa Karoo, very simple thing that we're trying there. Um, uh, we've got a student working on this, simply putting up little shade structures over the water holes so it brings the temperature down and those birds can land and drink. Yeah. Very simple. Um, another one we're investigating, working with Guy and Namita, um, whether in fact species can be helped to move to areas that are, are newly suitable for it. Um, just unfortunately, snapping through that one now. With corals, um, introducing algae, these anthelae species that are um, more able to withstand heat um, and less susceptible to bleaching. Um, and last but not least, we all like to hang around and when it's hot, um, we've all been to misted spaces. What if somebody had tried that for those trees in which those flying foxes um, were in? Um, so really some innovation that hasn't been done. So we have tools, not least our brains and individual talents and abilities to conserve nature under climate change. Let's get cracking, let's do it and be innovative, um, irrespective of what it is that you do, engineering, research um, or activism. Um, we don't have a lot of time. Um, and um, yeah, we really, uh, we really need to figure out how we're gonna do this. Um, we've got a whole nation of, or a globe of, of anxious people waiting for us to do it. Um, and often I
respond to water inputs. So being able to quantify these parameters enables us to better understand these ecosystems. And fortunately at uh, this study site, we have a pet tower approach where we have two eddy convergence towers about two, four kilometers apart from each other in the same reserve. And this allows us to piece out some of the differences between deep and shallow soil systems and kind of reveal some key points at this tension zone of two vegetation types. So this would ideally then allow us to look at questions regarding the structure versus function in responses to water and CO2 under different soil types. And in addition, understanding the, the, re the relative role of grass, 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 trees and grasses in the systems is critical in the midst of uh, afforestation talks for open ecosystems. So we see the Savannah Eddy Conference Tower here on the picture on the left and where the study site is situated in South Africa. It's kind of like right in the middle of the country. And uh, well, as we have previously highlighted, this uh, Benfontein Nature Reserve is along the border of the Free State in the Northern Cape provinces of South Africa, where we see this sharp soil depth, uh, spatial heterogeneity with deep soils hosting savannah, savannah-like vegetation in a matrix of uh, chemo thorns and C4 grasses, as well as your caroid, which uh, features your shrubs and grasses being hosted on much shallower soils, which is dominated by the Pensia globosia shrub. And uh, these contrasting, contrasting systems exist under the same painful regime, which offers uh, some lovely insights into the carbon balance of these uh, biomes. And these are pictures of these two systems which are co-located at the Benfontein Nature Reserve. So briefly here, we would like just to look at the diurnal net ecosystem exchange and evapotranspiration between the wet and dry season, between the, these uh, savanna and Namakaru vegetation types, where we see the strong effect of water availability with uh, very low fluxes observed during the dry season compared to the wet season. And we see both systems being productive during the day with the Namakaru evapotranspiration being more pronounced than the savanna, while uh, we are observing the savanna to be fixing more carbon actually than the Namakaru, which kind of gives us an, an indication of a low water use efficiency for the Namakaru. So we see our NEE on the left panel and uh, a split between the dry and wet season for the top and the bottom here. So having a much more seasonal uh, outlook at these uh, systems, we have a comparison here of uh, meteorological variables and uh, measured fluxes, where we see that uh, the strong effect of rainfall is also observed, seeing that the savanna is more productive than the Namakaru. And what is also clear here is the rapid response of these vegetation types to water inputs, uh, while the differences in soil water content are mainly due to the differences in the soil depth of these systems. And uh, we use also this data for some ground truthing of satellite data, where we see the tracking of uh, the normalized difference vegetation index, as well as the enhanced vegetation index uh, being uh, paired with uh, our mid ecosystem exchange. And you kind of see that there's a similarity in phase in, in, in these two uh, parameters. And yeah, Wait, sorry. Let's just see. Okay, my laptop is freezing a bit. No, okay, there we are. Uh, yes, so. Uh, just to confirm here, we see the savanna with more biomass and leaf area is actually fixing more carbon per unit water than the shrub dominated uh, system, uh, which is observed to be almost 50% more water use efficiency than the shrub dominated system. So here we just uh, put a slope between our cross primary production and our evapotranspiration on a daily time scale. And uh, we, we, we then have uh, this uh, lovely calculation of our water use efficiency at an ecosystem scale for uh, a comparison between these two vegetation types. Uh, we see uh, the Namakaru coming in at about 0 0.38 grams per kilogram of water, 
compared to about 0 0.56 grams of uh, carbon for the savanna per kilogram of water. And, uh, and uh, we also experienced some uh, extreme events in these environments. So following a slightly wetter than usual season, there was an increase in biomass and the recent drying kind of led the system to sustain this uh, huge fire that was so hot that it killed uh, well-established camel phones in the reserve. So we managed to capture this with our instruments where we saw that just as the fire was approaching the savanna site, we were measuring around 766 uh, parts per million of, of CO2 concentration uh, during the fire. And we were able to then continue measuring post the fire. And we are now then heavily interested in kind of measuring during this recovery period to kind of help us understand how wildfire is, is a driver of medical system exchange and, and, and the long-term variability of, of, of medical system exchange. And so, yeah, this kind of leads us to the preliminary conclusions of this 280 data set that we've been measuring, where we see that the savanna is, is is more productive and water is efficient than the Namakaru vegetation. And we seeing that photosynth photosynthetic active radiation and VPD drive NEE as well as soil moisture being quite a key variable for productivity. We are clearly seeing that more carbon is sequestered during wet soil conditions. And this gradually decreases, when, gradually decreases with uh, drying in both vegetation types. And yeah, that should be it. Thank you. I'm going to thank you for a very clear, uh, beautiful talk. That beautifully illustrated, uh, that is one amazing system. And that extreme event certainly um, was cause for uh, some concern. Um, great. Uh, Amu, that was great. I'm going, to, I'm going to now hand over to, to Felix Kasana, who is shared a uh, student between the School for Climate Studies and the CSIR, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Um, Felix is going to tell us about his work on, um, on bush encroachment, the uh, process by which trees are in, in encroaching into savannas, as Chris Tresos talked about, and this very important mechanism by which they steal water away from the grasses. So um, over to you, Felix. I've given you co-hosting rights, and uh, let's see if you can share your screen and show us your, your lovely work. Uh, thanks, Guy. Um, I'm not sure. Can you see my screen? Uh, I can indeed. Perfect. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, um, good evening, everyone. Um, as Guy has introduced me, I'm Felix Kosana. Today I'll be talking about wood encroachment, how wood encroachment changes water availability in arid savannas of Southern Africa. Over time, uh, wood encroachment has become a global phenomenon driven by CO2 fertilization and land use change, um, such as fire suppression and overgrazing. Um, looking at this meta-analysis by Stevens et al., we can see that wood encroachment um, is widespread across the savannas of Southern America, Africa, and Australia. As much as wood encroachment can be beneficial in the provisioning of uh, ecosystem services, such as the provisioning of woody fuels and the regulation of um, carbon dioxide, um, we have uh, over time observed um, that wood encroachment can be problematic in terms of radically transforming biodiversity, um, ecosystem processes, and also affecting ecosystem services. Um, the widely documented ecosystem service that has been reported is reduction in grazing capacity. Um, also, there has been a growing concern that with increase in wood encroachment, um, there might be um, a, a, a reduction in water availability to recharge rivers and under, other underground water reserves, and also for uh, utilization by other plants. This is uh, due to uh, canopy interception in addition to evapotranspiration. However, when looking at the dry savannas of um, Africa, 
this mechanism of canopy interception hasn't been documented. When it rains, um, some of the rain gets captured by tree canopies and evaporates back into the atmosphere, a process called canopy interception. Um, when the canopies get saturated, some of that rain gets channeled um, to the ground via stem flow. Some of it flows through the gaps of the canopies and reaches the ground via through flow. Um, as much as we, we understand these partitions of rainfall, However, we do not understand how these allocations are changing with canopy characteristics, such as either being a fine leaf species or a broad leaf species. And we also do not understand how these allocations are changing with rainfall characteristics, such as rainfall size and rainfall intensity, which is why in this study, we aimed at quantifying rainfall partitioning by a fine leaf dichrostachia scenario and a broad leaf terminalia cerisia across a gradient of wood encroachment and rainfall intensity. This study was done at West Red Facility. Um, this semi-arid system receives a mean annual rainfall of about 650 millimeters per annum. And among other species that exist in the area, uh, Dacrostechus cinerea and Terminalia cerisia are the most encroaching um, woody species. To measure canopy effects on rainfall partitioning, we installed rain gauges in the open to measure gross precipitation. We also installed some of the rain gauges underneath tree canopies, um, as illustrated in these pictures, to measure through fall. We also attached some collars around the stems um, to channel water into these buckets to measure stem flow. The addition of through fall and stem flow gives net precipitation, and therefore we calculated interception um, by subtracting net precipitation from gross precipitation. Um, rainfall intensity, uh, on the other hand, was calculated by dividing gross precipitation by the duration of each rainfall event. Now looking at the rainfall characteristics during the sampling period, we recorded a total of 45 rainfall events, um, which accumulated to um, uh, 389 millimeters of rainfall. The majority of those rainfall events were below 10 millimeters, uh, followed by eight events, which were uh, between 10 to 20 millimeters, and only five events, which were above 20 millimeters. Um, as much as the 0 to 10 millimeter rainfall class had the most uh, rainfall events, however, it contributed the least to the total rainfall recorded during the study period. Um, it was also um, characterized by being low uh, in, in terms of rainfall intensity. Now, what we found in terms of rainfall partitioning between the two species, um, we found that Dactrostachus intercepted more water um, at about 22.6% compared to 16% by Terminalia. Throughfall was uh, lower by Dactrostachus at about 71.6% compared to 80.8% uh, for Terminalia. Stem flow, however, was higher for um, Dactrostachus um, compared to Terminalia. Now, when looking at um, the response of these uh, partitions to increase in wood cover or increase in tree basal area, we can see that um, stem flow and interception increased with increase in tree basal area uh, for both species. Through fall, however, decreased with increase in tree basal area. Now, in response to rainfall intensity, uh, we actually observed an opposite in terms of uh, rainfall, uh, in terms of um, interception. We can see that the highest interception for both species uh, was at low rainfall intensities. Now, just to quickly summarize these results, firstly, we found that um, high interception loss and stem flow um, was um, by the fine leaf species, uh, which is the Dacrostachus scenario, compared to uh, the broadleaf terminalia. 
Secondly, we found that interception um, and stem flow increased across a gradient of 40 encroachment. And thirdly, we found that um, the highest interception was recorded at low rainfall intensity. Now, the take home message from this um, is that the higher interception and stem flow by the fine leaf shrubs in these arid systems um, can be an evolutionary strategy um, to steal the rain from the shallow rooted grasses by minimizing throughfall during the frequent low uh, rainfall events and also by channeling um, the stem flow during the, the occasional large rainfall events. Um, on that note, um, I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you. Felix, that was brilliant. And uh, for those in the Northern Hemisphere who um, focus a lot on how plants steal light from each other, it has a whole different approach, a whole new view on how canopies may be structured and selected by their ability to steal rain. Absolutely. Uh, which I think is really fascinating. Yeah. Thanks, Felix. Um, I'm going to remove uh, your permissions. And then we'll, uh, we'll hand over to Jesse Yule, who uh, has been doing some incredible work on an endemic seagrass species. Jess, I'm just making you co-host. So we're going uh, more now into a species level uh, look at things. And uh, Jess is the second last talk, and uh, Kerry will be uh, following her up on uh, quiver trees. But over to you, Jess. Thanks, Guy. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Cool, so I'm going to be chatting to you um, about a very different system where I have been looking at the effects of warming on a South African seagrass species. So seagrass, uh, seagrasses and the estuarine ecosystems in which they occur are identified as amongst the most threatened by human pressures and climate change, while also providing critical ecosystem services. For example, in this picture of the Isimangalisu estuary in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, it is possible to see artisanal fishers' nets arrayed in the shallow waters whose fish populations are supported by seagrass and other plant populations. This is one of the many ecosystem services that these systems provide for not only the human well-being, but also contribute towards both adaptation to climate change and mitigation objectives. In South Africa, the seagrass Sastrocapensis is near endemic, being found almost only in Southern African estuarine waters and whose distribution is thought to be controlled to a large extent by air and water temperature. Species under strong temperature control are a concern due to projections of local temperature changes and how these may affect estuaries. So changes in annual sea surface temperatures have been shown to have decreased by 0.5 degrees Celsius between 1984 and 2009 in the cool temperate regions due to coastal upwelling conditions shifting and have been shown to have increased by 0.55 degrees Celsius in most parts of the tropical and subtropical regions during the same time period. In addition to this, longshore coastal gradient temperature shifts are expected to continue together with an increase in land sea temperature gradients as a result of terrestrial heating. So in addition to this, marine heat wave events are also projected to rise in cumulative intensity along the South African coastline. This is of particular concern for seagrasses as it reduces the availability for recovery and can result in permanent ecosystem damage in certain hotspots of change. For Zostrocapensis, these shifts in temperature could cause a loss of up to 18% of its suitable habitat range by 2050, unless the species is able to show um, adaptive capacity to warming. However, the wide biogeographical range that Zostrocapensis occupies suggests potential adaptive tolerance to a wide range of temperatures and the clear range boundaries indicate the potential limits to this adaptability. 
So this offers the opportunity to explore both short-term and long-term adaptive strategies in physiology by measuring changes in photosynthetic efficiency. So to do this, I conducted short and long-term warming experiments on Zostrichopensis, sampled from estuaries found within each bioregion. So where I did this was the Olifants, the Breda, Swartkorps, and Cozy estuary. And I measured photosynthetic efficiency responses, which are known as FV over FM. And this measures stress in systems responsible for carbon uptake by plants. So these are the physiological responses to my short-term warming treatments, where FD over FM above 0.7 indicates that plants are healthy, and FD over FM below this indicates that plants are stressed. So I found that the four bioregions differed in their photosynthetic tolerance to warming under field conditions, with all sites significantly decreasing in efficiency at the warmest temperature. What was particularly interesting was the high sensitivity of Coast Estuary, the warmest tropical site, to all temperatures, which could indicate that the species is close to its range limits in the site. In contrast, both cooler sites, the Olifants and Breda, had the highest tolerance to warming. But when transplanted to controlled cooler temperature conditions in the laboratory, all sites showed a rapid acclimation um, and increased efficiencies to temperature, merely in the space of four weeks. And that was particularly notable in the cozy samples. This rapid acclimation within the cozy sites supports the theory that it may be severely locally stressed, and again, that it may be quite close to its range edge. Um, again, cozy samples also showed the greatest decreases to warming compared to the rest of the study sites with, again, both cool range sites, Olifants and Breda, showing the highest tolerance to warming in photosynthetic efficiency. So these pictures in front of you show the cozy bay sites where I sampled and for which it seems Zostrichopensis is under risk of decline if warming continues. And by contrast, at the cooler sites, which were Breda and Olifants, this species is less vulnerable to both short and long-term increases in temperature, which will provide core areas for conserving the species under changing temperature trends, and thus indicates the need to reduce other stresses in these regions to permit these communities to persist. Thank you. Brilliant, Jess. Beautiful, again, clear presentation. Exciting results for a, a new endemic and um, a look into a marine system, which is absolutely fascinating uh, and very useful. <laughs> Great. I'm going to hand over now to Kerry Gray, who is um, who's spent many, many months and years studying river trees and uh, finished her master's on quiver trees uh, a little while ago. Kerry, I've given you permissions and uh, right. over to you. Cool. Can you see my screen? I can indeed. Beautiful. Great. Um, so I promise to try and keep this short and punchy because I know we're approaching that hour and a half mark. Um, but as Wendy mentioned a little bit earlier, I'm going to go into a bit of detail on how um, we believe as um, as the Global Change Biology Group, Allo dichotoma, or more commonly known as the quiver tree, um, is being affected by climate change. So quiver trees are a keystone species in the arid, karoo, and desert biomes of Southern Africa, where they play important ecological roles as nesting sites, perches for raptors, sources of nutrition for sunbirds and ants in the flowering season, and their water storing trunks support browsers like porcupines and baboons during prolonged dry periods. Quiver trees typically grow in areas where moderately high mean annual temperatures favor their CAM photosynthesis. Over the past two decades, however, there have been growing observations of increased mortality in the warmer parts of its range, with high levels of recruitment in cooler, often more southern or higher elevation populations. 
Here you can see that the higher rates of mortality observed by Wendy and Guy and their other colleagues in 2007 generally overlap with higher mean annual temperatures with deviations resulting from cooler conditions at higher elevation populations. This is a common signal of climate change, with species globally responding to warming by migrating polewards or upwards in elevation. For immobile species like trees, this inevitably means local extinction of populations where growing conditions become too extreme. Questions still remain though, as to whether these observed population trends for quiver trees are a signal of climate change. So we asked ourselves whether we could look into the past to understand current population dynamics and better predict its distribution under a changing climate. To do this, we use species distribution modeling to predict the range of quiver trees back to the last glacial maximum, mid Holocene and to 2070 under RCP 4.5, the intermediate stabilization pathway. We prioritize temperature variables in our modeling, as we know that from our lab's past research, temperature is a critical variable for the establishment and distribution of quiver trees. This includes both from a correlative understanding, as well as a mechanistic understanding, where we found a direct link between temperature and the physiological functioning of juvenile and adult individuals, with little effect of water availability. From our models, we predict that about 80,000 years ago, during the LGM, when Southern Africa was about five degrees Celsius cooler than it currently is, quiver trees retreated to climate refugia in the equatorward part of their range, and north of that is indicated by the dark blue shaded areas. The red indicates that much of its current range would not have been climatically suitable for establishing um, during the LGM. Later, through the mid-Holocene, our models predict that northern areas that were suitable during the LGM would have become unsuitable as the local climate warmed, resulting in expansion of a suitable habitat southwards and slightly inland. This model of paleo range of the species can be supported by preliminary genetic analysis that indicates higher genetic variation, indicated by the blue shading, in the central and more northern parts of its current range, with lower genetic variation in mid Holocene expanded range areas, which is a typical signal of loss of genetic variation as populations establish further away from refugia. Our model suggests a future south and southeastward expansion of quiver trees as they track optimal growing conditions, gaining most of their new range in the interiors of South Africa. We also predict that hotter, typically more northern populations will lose suitable habitat, perhaps resulting in full dieback of genetically superior populations. Um, I just need. limits will experience local extinctions. However, um, there are some barriers to this projected range shift. Um, when calculating the predicted past rate of population expansion through the mid Holocene to present, it's likely that the species would have had to migrate at a rate of 0.4 kilometers per decade, a rate that's 15 times slower than what would be needed for quiver trees to track their suitable climate at current and future predicted rates of warming. Another problem that they face is the hard barrier to the east imposed by these grassy, fire adapted habitats that have been spoken about previously where it is likely that establishing juveniles will not be able to survive increasingly frequent fires. Similarly, it seems that there is a hard barrier in the south imposed by high elevations that are still too cold for establishment of quiver trees. It's likely, therefore, that the geographic range of quiver trees will become squeezed between high temperatures in the north, frequent fires in the east, and high frost-prone mountains in the south. These multiple factors make quiver trees useful as an indicator species for climate change and a powerful case study for the implementation of conservation actions. Thankfully, we know that there are populations in the south that are still stable, stable and conservation actions to protect these populations is becoming increasingly important. Thank you for listening to the talk. Yeah, great. Wow. Um, really, again, another interesting study.
Thank you, Kerry, for um, a fascinating talk going all the way back to the last ASL maximum and showing us how we can predict the future better by understanding the deeper past even better. Um, we've, uh, all, all of you have been brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, if anybody, uh, we have reached almost the limit of our time, but please, if anybody's got questions, raise your hands and uh, engage with these, uh, with these students and with, uh, with Wendy, who's the last remaining keynote. Uh, uh, we, we, we're open to, 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 to answer some short questions and engage in any discussion that uh, you'd like to, to do. Please don't be shy. Just uh, uh, raise a hand and uh, if, if you have a burning question, it's, uh, it's yours. There were some pretty provocative talks there, so uh, I don't know if anybody has grave objections to some of Wendy's more provocative solutions to solving problems of maintaining species richness under climate change. May, oh, I wonder if people, are, are you able to unmute yourselves? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, if you want to ask a question, maybe raise a hand and then I'll, I'll, I'll see it. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to call an end to the session. Yes, I see. Oh, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Guy, firstly, just to, com to, to, to confirm, we can raise our hands and unmute. Um, um, okay. But also, just to add to the provocation, um, really, we, we need innovative solutions. I'm not sure if I brought that home strongly enough. Like the crazy solutions, the crazy things that you might think up um, uh, are going to, you know, are, are going to, or they could well be useful. There are so many species that need very particular things. Um, yeah, like I really invite everybody to to have a, a puzzle over whether it's their species or another one they see in David Attenborough uh, documentary. Yeah, like off-the-wall solutions welcome. Yeah, it's great, Wendy. Thanks for trying to provoke. And, and, and also, you know, are there people from, from other systems who are, who've been stimulated to think somewhat differently about uh, what they're seeing in their systems? Anything like that, we also we, uh, be open to hearing about. Okay. Well, I, um, I guess we're at, we're at the end, and, I, and, and there may well be another session after after this. So uh, I, I suppose I should really um, bring it to an end. Thanks. Can I just thank our speakers once again? I, I think you did a, a brilliant job, and I think we've uh, shown this community uh, a great array of, of studies, uh, theory, and um, measurements, and experiments, laboratory, and in the field. Uh, giving them a view of our beautiful systems, which is also a bit of a tourism pitch. <laughs> Wendy is at this Bafka National Parks, and uh, they uh, desperately need uh, tourism dollars to, to maintain their, their, their business. But um, uh, so thank you all, and thank you all for attending. And um, I think uh, I will bring things to a close. Thanks all. Great. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Great. Thanks for the great talks, everybody. Really, really interesting. And thanks, Guy, very much for hosting. Apologies for my slightly taxi <laughs> Zoom. Yeah. If it's early, but I, 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 I'm on top of it now. I think I'm almost a Zoom expert. Not <laughs> <laughs> just any of us ever will then. Then they'll change it again. <laughs> great. Okay. Cheers. Bye, Thank guys. Thank you for the hosting. Pleasure. Great pleasure. I've, I have recorded it. It's on the, um, it's on the cloud, so I'll, uh, I'll let you know when it's available. All right. Thank you so much.